Like, I can't tell you for sure whether, like, uh, the $180 stereo amplifier that was in the trash, is that more or less valuable than the paper bag that I found that said, love means being nice to somebody even when they piss you off. It was somebody's lunch bag that had this, like, message from an apologetic partner. You know? I think that's a... There should be some metric to measure the value of things like that. I work for a company called Urban Ore that's in Berkeley. We are a company with an ecological mission and vision around a concept that the founders call zero waste. I spend the day looking through people's rubbish and lots of interesting things show up. I, I sometimes wait until people are finished to start looking through the boxes, but these ones had telegraphed themselves to me as being clearly of interest. So I began looking through them and found that they were full of reels of film and didn't get too far into the film before I saw the one which became the faded Moe's film, which was, uh, which caught the eye because it was labeled differently than the others. Rather than being in a canister, it was just on a reel, and it said new Mo cut, M-O cut, in wax pencil. And I thought, well, what could that mean? And I peeled off the tape, held it up to the light, and I could see that the image on the film, which of course was pretty low fidelity because it was very, very small, um, corresponded to my memory of a photograph over the counter at most books. I was born in 1966, it was Moe's birthday, and um, my mother always said that, um, that I was a present to him and that she had done this on purpose somehow, as if like by the will of her intention, she like gave Mo a baby, you know. Um, and so I kind of grew up in this idea that I was sort of part of his story, and it, part of that is that I'm named after him, so his name was Morris, and so my mother named me Doris to rhyme. What bookstores used to do is a lot like what textbook stores do now. You buy a book, and then it's worth a dime. So there's no, you're always getting sort of ripped off. And Mo's idea of making the world better was fair trade. Like, let's be fair about it. You give me a book, I'm gonna sell it for this much, I'm gonna give you a percentage of that. That's fair, you know? That's really closer to what I'm gonna sell it for than you could even believe. It's the establishing of the trade and putting a sign up behind his head that said, here's my policy. I'm gonna pay up to this amount and I'm gonna be fair about it. And that, that's different than the way used bookstores used to do it. I remember in particular one time bringing in uh, some books that I had bought at, at uh, Butterfields, which is a very nice auction house in San Francisco on uh, Irish history. And they were all, I don't know, they were like 19th and early 20th century books. Um, some kind of some really nice bindings. Bring them in and selling them at the counter and Mo stepping in to the buy and going, ah, we don't want this, we don't want that, and like rejecting a bunch of the stuff from the from the stack that the buyer was taking. It was Owen Hill was the buyer. And uh, kind of throwing them back across the counter and they were like bouncing off the counter and flying out the door and landing on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and Doris was around and she stepped in and she said, oh, Mo, come on, be nice, don't be so mean. And he's like, next time you find a bunch of books in the dumpster, don't bring them in here. <laughs> I like to work at the counter. People like to reminisce about how long they've been coming here. Or maybe they remember Mo or they want to talk about books, but it's fun at the front counter. And um, so someone comes up who... I didn't know, but I've learned since that he's a regular here at Moe's. I didn't know him. Kevin's a customer here, and uh, he's, uh, he's someone we're happy to see walk through the door. I didn't know what he did for a living uh, until he, he handed over this roll of film and said, oh, hey, I found this uh, 
at the dump and uh, it says Mo on there and, and I recognize Mo from that poster on the wall up there behind you. I was dumbfounded. I mean, I was really surprised that such a thing existed. And like, who is he? And how did it happen? It was such a surprise. Well, it looked like Mo in there, but uh, all the splices were old, and so it was a lot of scraps of film. They weren't all held together because the splices had, you know, they're just tape, I guess, and the adhesive had come off. So uh, it was a lot of loose pieces of film in the can. And uh, I immediately thought of my friend Gibbs. I get kind of philosophical about these type of things, I guess, because... Um, you know, the universe created this, you know, silver material that's, you know, man somehow was able to divert to being instilled in this base thing, and it, you know, when, when, when pieces of the electromagnetic spectrum, that is the, you know, light hit it, it creates a, a grayscale type of range that, you know, creates an image of, of itself. So it's kind of a, it's a magical thing. Each, each sort of project that's conceivably decaying needs an advocate. And so something, you know, you know what happened. I mean, you know, if, if Scorsese thinks that something is fantastic, then he finds the money to preserve it. But think of all the instances when, you know, somebody's grandfather shot any number of other home movies where it ended up in the junkyard. I am, in a sense, like a, a witness. I'm like a, a yeoman. I'm a yeoman for these, like, lives that are being disposed of because there's no institutional means, no personal means for them to be maintained. When Kevin brought the film in like that, I felt, I felt, again, this awe that that could happen. That if this could wash up on the shore, that, like, anything could happen. Gibbs got back in touch with me maybe a month later and said, hey, it's, it's done, replaced all the splices, made a digital transfer. If you can bring a memory stick, I'll put it on that for you. It's really hard to capture someone, what they call larger than life. Like, how do you, what does that mean? Like, he died and it's gone. You know, you look at pictures and you remember things and you talk to people, but, you know, Mo really was a person in action. And that this film captured it, you know, it just, Delighted me. I w was a young guy trying to build a library, and so I went to all sorts of used bookstores because I couldn't afford new books. And um, and also, I think I liked used books in those days. It was cool. But I, I first met Mo when he had a little tiny store on uh, Shattuck Avenue, and I'm guessing that was around 1960. Then, because I went to all the bookstores in Berkeley, and there were many, many terrific bookstores in Berkeley, but I followed Mo from store to store. I liked him, and I, he, he was really good. Then, of course, you had the free speech movement and all the excitement of the politics. You know, culture was changing. The hippies were happening. And uh, so it was just an exciting place, and I wanted to be a filmmaker. I had eschewed the whole idea of writing anything. I thought writing was a old-fashioned kind of thing, and it was all about images. I filmed a lot of things that were happening in those days just because they were exciting, and I thought I was going to make a lot of films. I ended up making one film called How We Stopped the War with Country Joe and the Fish and the Big Peace March and so on, and that took a lot of the starch out of me, I think. But uh, then I... Uh, sort of in the next few years working as a film editor, I, I got distracted and actually discovered screenplays and found that was much more exciting and interesting to me, actually, than editing films. So I moved away from editing films and all the film that was unfinished and all the projects that weren't done remained in this storage unit. But they kept raising the prices over the years. All of a sudden, it became a huge burden, and then I had to get out of there. So I made this huge push that was an enormous effort for me. I mean, it was not easy to part with anything. And I parted with a lot of stuff and then brought an awful lot of stuff home that still has to be dealt with. And uh, as I say, I thought I brought the Mo film home. Now, this is where I would have expected to find the uh, footage of uh, Mo. It, what's this say? Alioto has spoken. I think that's just a little piece of film from the news. These are the Hell's Angels, I think I was telling you about. That Old Mo, what the oh. hell's this? <laughs> Uh -oh, Rough you? cut. Oh. Well, now, this, see, this is what I thought, 
this is amazing, you know, because this is, what's, what, how did that stuff get to the dump? What is this? Well, this is good fortuitous, isn't it? <laughs> you can't, let me see. Is that the rough foot from that day, and then you cut it into the other one? I don't know what the hell it looks like bookshelves and stuff. I, I have no idea what this is. And my and my rewinds are down and my viewers down, so you're going to have to give this to your friend at the archive. Be happy and to. he's going to have to check it out for I'd us. I'd be happy okay? to. That's so exciting. Look at that. It's another cut of it. Oh my Who gosh. Knows what, it is? what else oh have my. you got in oh there? My. And that's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm looking in here and these are winos. Okay. <laughs> Somewhere I had footage of Bobby Seal and uh, Huey Newton, before they were famous, hanging out at the uh, free speech movement stuff. Wow. Okay, what's this? Wow. Kids, no, Khrushchev does the can-can or something. In oh. You can see, I mean, this could go on for days. Well, isn't it great that you saved this stuff? Well, what's, yeah, well, what's great is I have all this stuff and I want it to find a place. I never would have dreamed that the way to find a place for something was to throw it in the dump. <laughs> If only I'd known that. And first, a, a friend called me and said he'd talked with an, another old friend I hadn't seen in years, and did I shoot something at Moe's with a Rolls Royce or something and, and at, at a big event? And I said, well, I did shoot the event, but uh, I don't remember a Rolls Royce, and uh, it, it couldn't... And he said, well, there was some film or something, and I said, well, maybe some... Uh, in my mind, I thought, well, somebody else must have shot it too. Uh, because I knew my film was in my garage safely. And, uh, cause I wouldn't throw that out. Um, I didn't know what to do with it, but I knew, to me, it had value. It was important. And, uh, as many of the films I have in my garage are. So, uh, I, uh, I was sure it wasn't mine. And then my friend John Levy, the one who had alerted uh, Doris to the fact that I might have been the person who shot it, because when he saw it, he saw I wasn't in it and thought, Dave probably shot this, right? Um, said that, but, but John said that there was this footage and I could see it on, this, on the internet. And I went and looked at the internet and my mind was blown. How could that be? How could my film be <laughs> on the internet when it's supposed to be in my garage, a little bit like the NSA or something? So... Uh, um, it was shocking, but it was delightful. It was wonderful. And to think that by accidentally sending it to the dump, it found the person who would appreciate it, Doris, right, and who would value it, it's just a wonderful thing. And I just couldn't be happier.
Thank you.